I want to thank you all for coming out here today. We're joined here in the rotunda of the Illinois State Capitol. And it might be a little messy. You'll see some lobbyists and legislators walking through here. You might hear some echoes here. And you might think there's probably a better place we could meet with better acoustics. But the idea is when we celebrate the contributions of African Americans to our state of Illinois, we don't want to have that shuttered off in a corner. We want this to be part of our state government, at the center of our state government. So please excuse us if there are some distractions. I want to thank our award recipients for being here today. Several of them thanked me for the honor. I said, I want to thank you for all you have done in your field, for your community, but thank you for being here today. Because the other reason we have this here in the rotunda is we know that people will walk through, people who might not ordinarily come to a Treasurer's African American History Month celebration. And hopefully they will hear about some of the accomplishments. What we want when we put out press releases is for young people to hear about what these men and women have accomplished in their lives and then to have a vision what they can do in their lives. So I want to thank the awardees here today. I want to thank everyone who took time to be here. And I want to welcome anyone who's walking by to sit down and join us. You're going to hear stories about some wonderful people. And you're also going to hear some remarks from some wonderful people. People who are my friends. Friends from the Senate, from the House, from the campaign trail, and now from executive office. You'll hear from our new Attorney General, Attorney General Kwame Raoul, and Lieutenant Governor Juliana Stratton. So thank you all very much. We have a lot of great people to hear from, and with that, I will take my seat. Enjoy the program. Well, thank you for that generous introduction, Miles. I, I feel like just sitting down right now and, <laughs> and having that sit as my uh, keynote address, but uh, Treasurer Frerichs would not forgive me for that. And uh, Reverend Doss, thank you as well. Um, most importantly, congratulations to all the award uh, recipients. Uh, it's an honor to be here back under the dome. I had to travel from afar across the street, my office across the street. <laughs> uh, it's kind of sort of unusual walking into this building and uh, no longer having an office within it. Um, but I am happy to be here. It is appropriate that we draw attention to black history by honoring not just the past, but the deeds of the present. Our ongoing history is written every day. As public officials, though, as we celebrate Black History Month, we have to confront why a part of that history is now reversing itself. Let's start with the past. When we talk about the black migration, we tend to talk about the great migration, the movement of millions of African Americans from the Jim Crow South to the industrial cities of the North in the 20th century. But it is the case that black folks have been seeking freedom and opportunity in Illinois for far longer. Chicago's founder was a man named Jean-Baptiste Pointe du Sable. You may know he was a black Haitian who migrated up the Mississippi to Peoria and eventually the shores of Lake Michigan where he settled in what would later become known as Chicago because he was prescient in seeing it as a place of trade. The mill, the store, the workshop at his trading post attracted fur trappers because of the strategic location. Like many Chicagoans after him, DuSable reflected, it, reflected the diversity as he was multilingual. He spoke French, Spanish, English, and several native languages. He saw an opportunity to become successful by doing business in the right place at the right time with people who came to his trading posts from many cultures. Black Americans who left their lives in the South behind and journeyed to Illinois in the early and mid 20th century were following his footsteps. They sought places where they could come 
and they could be free from codified segregation and free to achieve prosperity through their work. Factory jobs were abundant, but in moving away from the de jure segregation of, of the Jim Crow South, they had moved into what is its de facto brother, segregation tolerated by the government and tacitly backed by the power of the law. In numbers exceeding one million by the end of the World War II, black folks made Illinois their home, their place of trade, and the center of cultural renaissance. At the same time, Chicago and its counterparts throughout Illinois and the industrial Midwest were becoming the most racially segregated cities in America. Redlining and other forms of discriminations were, were exposed and made unwelcome, but the per persistent under-resourcing of communities of color remained. Now the present, another black migration is underway. Some have called it the reverse great migration. Cities throughout the North are seeing the effects, but here in Illinois, where Cook County still has a larger African-American population than any other U.S. county, it is particularly pronounced. The Urban Institute predicts that by the year 2030, Chicago's black population will be roughly half of what it was at its peak. This out-migration from urban, historically black er areas accelerates the spread of symptoms of disinvestment. It is no coincidence that some of the same neighborhoods that experienced the most shootings, the highest unemployment rates, the lowest tax bases, and the most poorly resources, re resourced schools also experience the most out-migration. The impact of, of such is so great of an exodus, it is profound. Depressed real estate values, vacant properties, underpopulated schools that garner fewer resources and are deemed ripe for closure. Why are so many black folks leaving Illinois' largest city? Like Dusab, many are seeking economic opportunity, better jobs that will pay the rent and may allow for upward mobility, Fewer neighborhood schools and chronically under-resourced schools are a factor. Safety is a factor. But all of these reasons can't be separated from one another. Disinvestment, lack of job opportunities, and the lack of educational opportunities make openings for crime. Often when we talk about crime and impact on black Americans, we cite statistics about disparities in incarceration about arrestees and perpetrators. But the victims of violent crime are also disproportionately black. Almost two-thirds of those who were shot to death last year in Chicago were African American. A black man in Illinois is 45 times more likely to die due to homicide with a firearm than a white man in the, in the state, according to a study published in the Annals of Internal Medicine. That is the third largest racial disparity in the country. Out-migration is taking with it a significant amount of black wealth. That doesn't mean every black family that has left Chicago is doing better finding the opportunity or safety that they sought. Better off families may be moving to wealthier suburbs or accepting good positions in sunbelt cities that are experience economic growth and investment. But many families of lesser means are moving to places where segregation and disinvestment continue to stalk communities of color. One third of students who transfer out of Chicago's public schools but stay in Illinois go on to enroll in districts that are majority poor and majority black. Three quarters of the top 50 Illinois school districts that receive Chicago public schools transfers are also among the most poorly funded, 
quartile of districts in the state. In Chicago, we must stop accepting conditions that are leading to out-migration in the first place, lack of economic opportunity, neglect of major majority, black neighborhoods, disinvestment of schools, closures that leave neighborhoods without schools, environmental degradation in poor areas, and the public health epidemic of gun violence. But also, we must determine not to accept these conditions anywhere in the state of Illinois. I'm sure many of you saw an investigative series in Governing Magazine a few weeks ago. It identified communities in downstate Illinois as some of the most segregated in the nation in both housing and education. Some of our cities also have some of the widest racial disparities in income. Communities in Illinois, despite the great economic, cultural, and ge geographic variety, are inextricably connected. Whether the issue is drug addiction or gun violence, or students graduated unprepared for the workforce, we cannot assume that a problem occurring in one community or one part of the state will be quarantined there. We must take responsibility for our interconnectedness, and we must learn from, we must learn from and support those who, like today's award recipients, are doing excellent work to generate opportunity to improve quality of life in all our communities. So we are our brother's keeper and our sister's keeper wherever our state, wherever in our state, they choose to live and raise their families. As Attorney General, I lead an office that is empowered to take on racial discrimination, environmental injustice, the scams that often target the poor and the most vulnerable, and educational and student loan fraud, which exploit those who are seeking to get ahead and give back to their communities. I also accept my duty as a public official to lead comprehensive efforts against gun violence. It is our plan to contribute to combating gun trafficking. And we are assuming, we are assisting crime victims with a commitment to expanding our definition of who is a victim of crime, understanding that untreated trauma can turn victims into perpetrators. We are, we are taking a statewide approach, working with law enforcement and prosecutors in communities throughout Illinois. Ladies and gentlemen, the patterns of black migration have shifted through our nation's history and no doubt will again. What has not changed is the impetus to seek out safety, freedom, and opportunity. It is our responsibility today and for every day going forth as civic leaders to work to make these available in every place to everyone, no matter their skin tone. Thank you so much. Decatur, Illinois with me, and I feel like that uh, being a son of a pastor, predominant uh, progressive church in Decatur that I need to call roll, uh, protocol, uh, I feel churchy. If, if you guys that grew up in church know what that means, but um, we're very thankful. I'm very thankful. First of all, I'm only going to spend a few minutes to uh, be before you. We have a lot of an amazing recipients that's coming right behind me, but uh, I want to definitely acknowledge uh, Treasure uh, Frederick. Ferrix, I'm sorry, Ferrix, uh, for this amazing opportunity that he has bestowed upon myself. So thank you, Treasure. I appreciate that. Um, as well as Miss Lisa Badger uh, for helping to facilitate. So thank you to you. Um, when I thought about today coming over here, thinking about uh, I'm not going to spend time talking about uh, myself, but just thinking about all that has went before us over these last 400 years for us to be here today because we, we understand that we didn't get here by ourselves, And so myself, I was able to uh, come to Decatur, Illinois through my grandfather, Roger Walker Sr., uh, back in the 50s and the 60s, who was bold enough 
to dare to take a chance to leave Brownsville, Tennessee, to come to Decatur, Illinois for an opportunity at that time called Wagner's Casting. Um, then my father uh, that started his first business in 1977, uh, which now he's still in business today. He does, uh, has funeral homes throughout the state of Illinois, Walker Funeral Home and Chapel. And I could not, uh, I would be remiss not to acknowledge my uncle Roger, which was the first African-American sheriff uh, for the state of Illinois, the late Roger Walker, Jr. Um, so I just want to say that I'm so thankful and appreciative of this honor and to be able to share it with these amazing recipients and just to be able to be thought of on something that I think personally that we should all be doing on a daily basis. So once again, I am appreciative, thank you, and I'm representing, uh, shout out to Decatur, Illinois, and to the state of Illinois. Thank you for having me, thank you. Thank you, Miles. <clears throat> thank you all for coming today. I am very honored and humbled by this award. I am also very honored to receive this during Black History Month. And you stole one of my quotes, <laughs> but I do, um, I do follow what Dr. King has said about what have you done for others. <clears throat> I've always tried to emulate Dr. King and what he stood for because of Dr. King and others I am able to stand here today and tell you our struggles are not over. Our struggles are easier, but they're not over. Injustice comes in many ways. Bigotry, racism, inequality, and poverty. I have tried to live my life by helping others. King said, Human progress is neither automatic or inevitable. Every step towards the goal of justice requires struggle, sacrifice, and suffering. The tireless exertions and passionate concern of dedicated individuals. I think it's important, especially in the light of things play, taking place in our country that we stand up and voice our concerns. Dr. King said, the ultimate tragedy is not the oppression and cruelty by the bad people, but the silence over that of the good people. When we are silent about injustice and poverty, bigotrism, big, bigotry and racism, we go backwards and we're destined to repeat history. I believe in reaching back a hand to pull someone else up. If all of us would do that, the world would be a much better place. In closing, I would like to thank Treasurer Frerichs for this award. I would also like to thank Lisa Badger for putting this wonderful ceremony together. I would like to especially thank my husband, Estes, who is my rock and who is always there for anything I do, and I mean anything. He's always been there supporting me. My, th my three children who were with me while growing up they were right there beside me working in the community, and I am so very proud of who they have all become. Last, I have to mention my new little grandson. He started his life off being born two, year, two months early, and he had his own struggles, and I am so very proud of where he is now. He's doing fine. I do have to um, mention a few other things people who are here. I would like to thank Kwame Raul for being here and our first African-American Lieutenant Governor, Juliana Stratton, who I admire so much. I would like to thank some friends of mine who are here, Kathy and Andy Mohelish, you're back there. And 
Most of all, in closing, I would like to thank the people who helped me in the community to do the things that I do, because without them, none of this would be possible. I do want to acknowledge the team that's here, because you guys, I look at you, and you're our future. That's why upstairs I was talking to you about continuing on your education and to become strong black men and represent our community well. And I hope that I was able to inspire you just a little bit. And for all the people who have helped me in the community, I accept this award for all of us. And once again, thank you, and I am so very honored. Well, I want to say thank you very, very much, Treasurer Frerichs, um, for this honor. And thank you so much, Lisa, for listening and really listening and valuing my story. Um, I'd like to very briefly, can I bring this down just a little bit? I'd like to very briefly share with you a message that is also a mission. In 2011, I was a U.S. Peace Corps volunteer in China. It was not until 80 of us arrived that they told us that China was the most difficult place for volunteers to integrate into because the language was completely different from English and the culture operated on a very different paradigm and set of values. One historian who spent his lifetime studying Chinese history and culture told us what you think you have figured out about the culture, realize it is always much, much richer and deeper and that you in fact know nothing at all. When I started working as a TRIO director at Lincoln Land Community College and saw students rolling in for new student orientation, I realized that for many students starting college is like moving to a foreign country. As college, we have our own language. We talk about FAFSA, FERPA, degree audits, academic pathways, and college has a culture too. There are definite rules of engagement, and the sooner students learn those rules, the more successful they'll be. It helps to have someone in your family who has completed a college degree. They can offer some guidance or at least be living proof that it can be done. Higher education professionals now recognize that many students are first in their family to get a college degree. They are first-generation college students charting out a new legacy for their families and opportunities for themselves. Often the greatest barriers that college students face are not academic ones. In the national study of 33,000 community colleges, seven, I'm sorry, community college students, 70 community colleges across 24 states, 50% were determined to be housing insecure, 13 to 14% homeless, 2% had spent time in a shelter, two out of three were food insecure. We must as a society and as a community remove non-academic barriers so that everyone can start college, stay in college, and complete a college degree. Our collective well-being depends on it. I'd like to thank my colleagues for your trust and support and companionship in this effort. Dr. Leslie Frederick, Sarah Shifley, Fabiola Gonzalez are here today. I would like to thank my parents, not only for strongly instilling in me the value of education, but for delivering the first round of training in how to be a successful student. To my Aunt Sylvia, a special thanks for helping me to readjust from life in China back to U.S. culture. She probably didn't realize how instrumental she and my Uncle Arthur were in that process. And a heartfelt thank you to my husband Nathaniel, who knows when to be my mirror. Good afternoon. Thank you first to Treasurer Frerichs for this wonderful opportunity. I am so humbled and honored for this moment in time and in history to be here before you. 
To whom much is given, much is required. And as for me, my life, I tried to live as a servant. So to be honored as a leader, I really take that graciously. I believe in serving first because leadership comes second. You lead by your vision, you lead by what you do and in your actions. So I'm thankful for this moment. I want to also thank my husband. I want to thank all my family and friends for being such a support and a foundation and a support of love for me as I sojourn through this life. I'll give you back your time this afternoon. Thank you. Um, Kim took a lot of the words out of my mouth. But <laughs> as she always does. Um, thank you again to Treasurer Frerix um, and Lisa Badger for putting everything together uh, for the words from my uh, fraternity brother, Kwame Raul. Um, just real quick, um, you know, what you heard was a lot of our accomplishments. And what I want to do is make it bring us back to reality because um, for what we've accomplished, you know, what we've all accomplished here, um, it's come with great sacrifice. You know, time away from home, family, um, vacations, all these, all the things that um, other people take for granted to do service um, for other people. Um, my service has been because I chose not to be apathetic and I chose to get involved. And that's really a message for the young people. A lot of times we talk about you know, who's going to do it. It's up to you to do it. But at the end of the day, um, I'm thankful for receiving this honor. I'm actually very overwhelmed by it as I am with all the awards that I've uh, received in the past, because when I look in the mirror, what I see is just a kid from Danville. So I'll give you back your time. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you. And for those who made this possible, I was telling our treasurer when I first got here and I heard about this award, I said, I'm like Evelyn Press, I'm all shook up here. I never thought it would happen. And it's like a Reverend Dawes was saying, I was one of those migration from Mississippi that came up to Illinois. My mother brought all 11 of us up from Mississippi, Clarksdale. And since I was the eldest, oldest, she had me in charge. So I got a, a head start in labor and workforce, you name it, and organizing my, my sister and brother. And I thought East St. Louis was the most, like I said, Vegas to me. And uh, she said, get to go to school. I didn't miss a day. And so uh, track and field, Lincoln High School, and made it to uh, SIU. Now I'm thinking, I'm from Mississippi, great start. I ran into a woman from Clark <laughs> Columbus, Mississippi, my wife of 41 years, Linda Franklin. <laughs> now, <laughs> and, and, and um, finish it up, um, IDOT was my dream job. Um, caring about people was a, a big concern of mine. I was already mentally in that mode of, let's make a middle class, and we can get people good job, decent job, and pay them a decent salary, you got a middle class. Who's going to pay the bill? The poor can't pay the bill. You need a middle class, create one, that can pay the bill. Now, once you create it, you got to pay them a fair salary. I tell the treasurer, if someone making 2000 a month, you know, you're paying taxes, how about get them up to 5000 You can pay more taxes. And what left over, you're going to spend and stimulate the economy. So let's negotiate a good contract and get everybody well paid. Now, <laughs> yeah. Now, little do it, I know 39 years, and they say, Holy Jimmy, you owe us five more. I said, well, <laughs> But anyway, I got I got a um, a great 
crowd here I, that I want to uh, want you all to know and recognize, he, and it's all support in the world. I'm gonna go with the family. And I'm gonna go with labor. Here, my son Jamie Franklin, Hampton University. My my wife's sister, Tippy Berry, from Arena, Mississippi. Her brother, Lou Jeffro. We got Musta alumni, PhD from the University of Illinois, LaVon Singleton, AKA. We, we also have Ms. Sharon Bird, civil engineer slash EAP lady, Western Illinois. Now my team's a brother. From the exception of the team, so being part of IDOT, so we used to not be union. I want our, my vice president, Dave, Big Dave Rush, stand up. We got our legal counselor, JP Fine, JP, and the and the man, the man with all the money, Mr. Clapfelter. <laughs> Write me out a check. I need one. <laughs> but uh, I, I'm just. I, I never would have dreamed in all my years a country boy from Mississippi that's brought up here and to accomplish and, and to care for people and to continue to fight, continue to try to make it better. Um, my coaching, and I, I came back and I look at the kids and I believe in second chances. Uh, uh, some of our kids doesn't get that second chance and, and being on that staff, my goal were to give them a second chance and all nine of us coaches, we know from a freshman to a senior, we have to get them in somebody college. Whether it's a JUCO, a, a Tech, a full year. And we've been successful in getting our kids in, in this all major Rice University. And when we can get that done, they can become remarkable. And hopefully, they come back and relieve me for the, some of all this pressure. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's been fun. And so my journey, is to make the whole world a better place. And I want to thank, um, like I said, the treasure here for inviting me and all the co committee. And God bless everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm overwhelmingly humbled by this award. And I'm in awe of the stories that I've heard with the women and men that I share this platform with today. Um, this is amazing. I am here only because of the 10 teams that I had prior to this, my 11th year. This group of kids that you see with these white shirts on, that's what it's all about. I am up here because of them. I stand behind them all the time. And right now it's kind of funny that I'm in front of them because I, hang on to their shirt tails everywhere I go, and it's because of a group of young men like this that um, inspire me to keep on doing what I do. I love what I do. Um, I will keep doing it until um, it's time for me to step aside, let someone else take that, that helm. But I, I just love my kids. Um, I, it's all about the kids, and as long as that is um, near, and, um, and in front of me, uh, this group of kids that I have, they take me on a ride every day. If you, if you coach high school basketball kids, you, you know that every day is, is something different. Um, so that is a challenge, and it also like, keeps, you know, keeps my motor burning. So um, I thank you. I'm not going to be up here long. I want to thank the Honorable um, Lieutenant Governor Stratton for being here and Honorable Frerichs for this amazing award that I had no inkling that I was even um, capable of getting or receiving. Um, I want to thank Parrish. I want to thank Jennifer uh, for, for doing, doing what you have done. I want to thank um, my assistant principal somewhere who's been with Jennifer who um, coordinated these shirts. Oh, there she is, Erica Metz, for helping. And I want to thank my amazing wife for 31 years who allows me to, my wife Joanne, who's standing, she won't, there she is, um, who, who um, is like my assistant coach, you know, she gives me the game plan every game before the game. Um, she's never lost a game, I have, but she hasn't. Um, 
I want to thank my daughter for being here. Uh, she's my biggest fan, you know. Um, You know, they keep me humble. Yeah, um, my son, is, he's, in, he's in Jeffersonville, Indiana right now, and I'm sure they'll get the information back to him. But I just want to say thank you. I'm going to be short, and I'm going to get out. But this is, this, like I said, this is, um, I'm very humbled by this award, and um, I love my kids, and it's because of them. I wish they could stand up here. Thank you all for having me here. Uh, first, I want to give honor to God for allowing me to be in his presence and in your presence today. Second, I'd like to thank uh, Treasurer Ferrix for selecting me for this honor. I am so excited for our Lieutenant Governor, Juliana. I feel like I can say, call you by your first name because you were in Peoria all the time. <laughs> Thank you all for being here. I, I, as an elected official, I want to tell you that when I was elected in 2013 and they said, well, you're going to be the first African-American female in Peoria on the council. I'm like, no, this is 2013. You, you can't be serious. They were, and I am. But we're going to change that here in the next couple of months. I do what I do, not for me, but I do what I do, I tell for people, I used to say because of my grandson, now I have two, but it was my first grandson. He's 11 now. And it's funny because when his friend asked him what, he calls me mom, when his friend asked him what his mom does, he says, she goes to a lot of meetings. So to him, that's all I do is go to meetings, but I take him with me so he sees what those meetings are all about. At 11 years old, he needs to understand that he has a place, that I am grooming him to take my place, that I don't plan to do this for the rest of my life. My goal is not to die in office. Lord, you're listening. <laughs> but what it is that we do is a, is a powerful thing. When the Attorney General was talking about Chicago and all the ills that are inherent in Chicago. I thought he was talking about Peoria. We are named in Governing Magazine that came out two weeks ago as the, eight, the sixth most segregated community in the country. That was only followed by the, our education system in the city of Peoria named the most segregated in the country. And, you know, when you think about that, in 2019, your city is called the most segregated. When we talk about the reverse migration, to add to that, we have many people don't understand there is an African-American brain drain as well. That we have students in Peoria, Illinois, who go off to go to college, and they don't come back. Because when they left there, there was nothing in Peoria for them. And so my goal as an elected official is to make sure that I am adding to the conversation around the horseshoe, to let them know that there is more that unites us than what separates us. And it's because we sometimes are in our own little silos, we forget that. I had a conversation just this morning with a city staff member about a contract that should have been awarded differently. And in his mind, he was doubling the number of African Americans in this particular contract. I said, but what you're doing, we had two people doing this position, doing this contract. So instead of giving the second person who came on board, it happens to be an African American female, Instead of giving her more work and more funding so that she could grow her business and now hire more people, we bring in another person who just happens to be a minority as well. I said, so what you're doing is pitting two minorities against each other. And it wasn't like we made the pie bigger. We just split up how many people were eating that pie. And so this minority female who could have grown her business, and I was told by the finance director yesterday, well, her business is kind of small. And I said, and thanks to you, her business will stay small. Because if you don't give her that opportunity, if she doesn't have anything, any negative reviews, you're satisfied with her work, she had to come in as a mentee under the majority culture of business, but this third person who happens to be a male didn't have to do that. Is there any wonder why there are so many more females in our National Congress right now, because we have to understand that women are a force to be reckoned with. Thank you, Juliana. And we're going to make our, our, our voices heard. 
I am particularly excited about this award because in our current political climate nationally, it is so contentious, and it doesn't need to be. Let me get graphic for a second. We all put on our shoes one foot at a time, and so we are not so different, but we have to help each other understand that we are only as strong as our weakest link. And if we're not helping those who who are um, born in circumstances that are not of their control, that is what we're here for. I started out my comments by giving honor to God because I always think, what, what would Jesus do? And this whole separation of church and state, it can, be, it can be somewhere else, but in my heart, I put God first, and I pray before every city council meeting that he directs my path he, he has calmed my voice when I would want to snap on some folks, and I thank him for that. So as I conclude, I want to thank also my husband. My husband has often, has, is oftentimes heard to say, if I don't feed you, you won't eat. Because I get so busy with the things that I'm doing that I forget to eat. And it's a wonderful thing that he loves to cook, and I love to let him cook. So thank you, my husband, because if it wasn't for you allowing me to, to have the time to do what I do, um, I don't think I'd be, be as successful as I am. And so I'll leave you with this. Uh, last week, I lost a very dear friend uh, to cancer, a 52-year-old female who left three children. And at that young age, I was reminded that we need to hold our loved ones close that if there's somebody that out there that, that upset you and your family, what would Jesus do? Thank you for allowing me to be here today. Thank you all for, for being here and helping me to recognize this. I too, someone said they were very shocked and amazed. I didn't even know this was a thing. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, Milas, for that wonderful introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Wasn't that a wonderful program? Yes, absolutely. And thank you so much to Treasurer Frerichs for inviting me to be a part of this Black History Month celebration. Um, Treasurer Frerichs is not just a friend, but he is a wonderful partner in the work to help move our state forward. And I appreciate how he's not only our state's chief investment officer, but he shares his knowledge and his expertise with all of us so that we can make sure we strengthen our families and our communities. And it's always good to hear from my good friend, uh, Attorney General Kwame Raoul. I was so grateful for his remarks as well. And of course, congratulations to all of today's award recipients. Thank you for all that you do to better our communities and our state. It is an honor to serve as your Lieutenant Governor. And I'm so proud of the work that Governor Pritzker and I have accomplished in just these few short weeks. And I'm so excited about the work that lies ahead, work that will require all of us to work collaboratively and in partnership with one another so that we make sure that every community all across our state is lifted up. Now, I won't be before you long, um, but as we close out today's celebration, I wanted to leave you with this one thought. Black history is still being made every single day. That is. Black history is not just about pulling out the history books and going back to our ancestors on the continent of Africa or through the transatlantic slave trade. It is more than what happened during Reconstruction or the Jim Crow era or the Civil Rights Movement. And all of that is important and it's knowledge that must be preserved and passed down through the generations because as we know, if we don't remember where we've been, we won't know where we're going. But less than a month ago, on January 14th, 2019, I placed my hand on my grandmother's Bible, and I raised my right hand to be sworn in as the first black lieutenant governor here in Illinois. And having just celebrated the bicentennial of, of our state, 
It was an example of how 200 years in, there is still black history being made right here in the state of Illinois. And it's being made daily. Some of us here today can say we were the first. Sometimes we're in spaces where we say we are the only. And most of the time, we can point to family members or mentors or teachers or coaches or community members who have opened doors for us and who cheered us on as we made our way through those doors, understanding that we now have an obligation to open those same doors for others. As your Lieutenant Governor, I will not only lift up my voice to speak out about injustices and inequities, but I will lift up the voices of our communities all across Illinois, voices that are often left out or ignored, voices that must be included if we are truly going to have a just and equitable society. Voices from communities all over our state, particularly the black community, which deserves a seat at the table where decisions are being made. Today's awardees represent what happens when we are civically engaged and we step up to have an impact in the areas of business, education, leadership, workforce and labor, sportsmanship, public service, and community service. And I'm so grateful to Treasurer Frerichs for recognizing that black history is not just about the past, but it's about the work that's being done by the trailblazers that have been recognized today. We stand on the shoulders of those who came before us. I stand on the shoulders of Harriet and Sojourner, Fannie Lou and Ida B, Rosa and Shirley. And we stand as black history. You are all black history. And because of your tremendous work, there will be young people perhaps years from now, who will wonder why a door was open to them. And someone will tell them the story, and it will be your story. And your legacy will then leave, live on through them. Thank you again for the opportunity to share a few remarks. May all of us continue to lift up black history as a critical part of the fabric of our society, because black history is American history, and there is still so much more to be made. Thank you again.